Today I'm going to run out of ink. I've moved on to a new book, The Worm Ouroboros, by E. R. Edison. This book was a favorite of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Edison was a guest member of the Inklings. The book is a fantasy set on Mercury, but not the Mercury we know. It's another fantasy world. The protagonist arrives there through a portal in his home. I love that concept. Apparently C.S. Lewis loved it too. And today, when we allude to a portal to a fantasy land, we cite Lewis. Picasso said good artists borrow and great artists steal. There's a lot to be said for this. Literature is a conversation. There's a TV program with a similar in-house portal. Actually, I don't understand the premise, but in every episode, two figures from history come to a professor's home to debate philosophy. It's called Saints vs. Scoundrels, and I wish I could write a teleplay for them. They have guests like Edith Stein against Nietzsche, or Francis of Assisi vs. Machiavelli, it's so interesting, and if you're into ideas, I recommend you check it out. Back to the book. One of the things I really like about the storytelling style is the tension. It's very difficult to pull off tension between two people who are happy with each other. But what's done here is the happy husband asks his happy wife to join him somewhere later, and she declines. So there's not perfect unity between them, but they continue to laugh and interact with each other lovingly. Bishop Barron said the most exquisite moments in our life are tinged with sadness, and here you see it working beautifully. Some people don't like the book because of the writing style, but to that I say, the book is 95 years old. It doesn't have the res it doesn't have the revolutionary simplicity we're accustomed to. For fun, later on, I'll point out some cardinal sins with the syntax, sins according to the writing rules today. But this isn't to condemn it. It's to show how different the book might have been were it written today. I once took a tour of the Longfellow House in Portland. That's Portland, Maine, the place where the poet lived. On a small desk there was a slanted, wo a slanted wooden box that had a flip-top. The docent said it was Henry Wadsworth's laptop, and everyone in the tour group laughed. Someone said, imagine what he would have done if he had a laptop, and I couldn't hold in my response. I said, if he had a laptop, he never would have written anything, nor would he have been fluent in eight languages. That sobered the crowd, and they stopped laughing. Anyhow, another, mo another complaint of modern-day readers is the surplus of description. Normally, I would agree. I don't care much for Charles Dickens because of his overwrought descriptions. But the descriptions in The Worm are fantastic. Maybe you need to know what clematis is, and the other gorgeous flowers and gemstones described in the book. A grand picture is painted by the descriptions, and it's a painting I want to enter. But I suppose it's all a matter of degustibus, a matter of taste. I happen to think the book is magical. And now I'm about to run out of ink. Do I look like a reasonable man or a peppermint nightmare? The first one? Wrong. Math time. The pen I used is a Lamy All-Star 
extra fine steel nib and the ink is not a peppermint nightmare it is a sweet sweet dream from Robert Oster Australian for ink in the color peppermint and it's I love the color it's not like mint that grows outside at least mint in the USA I don't know if mint leaves in Australia look more like this anyhow it looks more like those old candy canes I say old meaning you candy canes from days gone by where it's a very distinct green and white stripe so it's a little bit dark a little bit aqua anyhow I love it it's a very pretty pretty color and it behaves very well and you will see the math proving that it barely goes through in fact I would even say because I'm using kind of inexpensive paper if you had good paper it wouldn't even go through despite how dark it is oh where's my value finder let me prove to you how dark this ink is just a mo okay so to compare here's my value finder you see can you see okay so it kinda looks black <laughs> through the value finder and to compare look at the the darkness of the line the margin line and that margin line does go through as you see on the other side of the page oh sorry that margin line oh that margin line barely goes through okay so on this value finder it has just a teeny tiny bit less of a value than this color so it's this is darker than the pink line yet it doesn't go through so that's a plus and I don't know how they do that it seems like witchcraft anyhow <laughs> so that is the ink I like it a lot and the paper is Mead college ruled reinforced filler paper reinforced on this edge here and now I'm gonna show you the magic the magical science of why what makes this pen so wonderful or the ink so so wonderful so what I did was I measured the 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 nib and the feed and the cartridge bef when I ink once I inked it up I measured this whole entire unit before and then when I was out of ink I measured it again to get an accurate number or not a number to get an accurate calculation of how much ink I used and so after be oh sorry before it weighed 6.515 grams after it was 5.765 grams leaving us with 0.75 milliliters that's a pretty good number it's easy to do math with a number like that that's three quarters so then I calculated how many pages I, I wrote and I was writing kind of big um, I don't know you know how some days you just write a, a little in a little different size than normal anyhow I was able to get down 44 pages I'm gonna let that street sweeper go by I don't know if that's a street sweeper it's going too fast anyhow okay so I wrote 44 pages with that three quarters of a milliliter of ink so this is the way I do the math to find out how much it would be if I had been using a full milliliter you divide 44 by 3 because it's three-fourths 
to get 14 and 2 thirds. So if you multiply 14 and 2 thirds by 4, that becomes a whole, like 4 over 4. So you add 14 and 2 thirds to 44 to get 58 and 2 thirds pages per 1 milliliter. I hope that makes sense. It's, you know how some people are good at playing the piano but they can't teach piano? Not to say that I'm good at math. This is just a way that I do math and I don't know if I could ever explain it. Well, I'm sure I could. You know, gun to head. Yes, of course I could. But no one's holding a gun to my head. So, unless anybody jumps up and down and wants me to actually explain it better, I'm just going to keep going this way. So those were the pages. Now we get the words. And this is so exciting to me because this book is in the public domain. So you can look up the text on a variety of sources online. And I can start with the, the word I began with and the word I ended with and find the exact word count without counting a couple pages up and then doing an average and multiplying it. So I did exactly 3,888 words with three quarters of a milliliter of ink. And you divide three, you divide, no, you divide 3,888 by three to get 1,296, add that to the 3,888, and you, if I had used a full milliliter of ink, I would have written 5,184 words, which is so far the highest score of all inks. That makes this the best ink I've ever used. Actually, I shouldn't say that. It's the best ink I've ever measured. <laughs> so isn't that interesting? Robert Osta Peppermint. Now it's time for some fun. In the book, The Worm Ouroboros, there's a wonderful palace and it's appointed marvelously with all kinds of fabulous creatures, or I should say the furniture is in the shape of fabulous creatures. Fabulous, by the way, means coming from a fable. It doesn't mean like fabulous, which I suppose maybe in a hundred years that will become, or maybe even 10, that will become the new thing to say. Like instead of how all of the trendy people say, oh, this is iconic. They might say, oh, this comes from a fable. <laughs> Anyhow, one of the creatures was the hippogriff, and I kind of made this image by using the free paint application that comes with your computer and smushing two public domain images together. So it's half eagle, half horse. Where does this word come from? It comes from the Greek and the Italian. So in a way, I suppose you would call that a portmanteau. So in Greek, hippos means horse, and in Italian, griffo means griffin. And we all know a griffin is half eagle, half lion. And the first time that we've, that we have, how do I say this? We, we can't, we, there's no way for us to trace the exact origin of this word because all we have as a historical record is what has what has remained in existence through the ages um, the documents that have survived fire and flood so we don't really know but the earliest evidence we can find is in Virgil in the Eclogues and note how I spell Virgil it's different from how C.S. Lewis spells it because in the olden days, people spelled Virgil with an I, V-I-R-G-I-L, because they thought that it infused virtue in him. But we know from the classics that his name was actually spelled with an E. And that is all I have. So until next time, long may your big jib draw. Songs of loudest praise.
Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise his name I fixed upon it 